there's no way for me to cover this whole chapter tonight. I will give you some things that I hope you will have time to read this week because it will give you a way to grasp the magnitude of what's predicted here. And you'll remember that in chapter 17, we saw a great deal about how the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation predicts the great Gentile world empires that would rise. Now they would succeed one after another. And we saw that the last stage of Gentile power is going to be a revived Roman Empire. I call it Roman Empire Phase Two. It predicted with precision all of these empires in the past, and that the only one that it didn't predict would be destroyed was the Roman Empire. It just predicted that it would fade away and go into a mystery form. It would cease to be a physical empire, but it would continue to have a mystery religious form. And so Revelation chapter 17 especially pinpointed what would be the religious form of this revived Roman Empire. And we saw how it talked about mystery Babylon the Great, mother of harlots, and let me get that. Revelation 17, where it says in verse 5 of Revelation 17, and upon her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the great, mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And then it talks about who this woman is that's called mystery Babylon at verse 18. It says, the woman whom you saw is the great city, which literally is reigning over the kings of the earth. Now, we saw what that was. I'm trying to catch some people. I know there's some people here for the first time. So forgive me for backtracking a little. What city, when John wrote the book of Revelation, was reigning over the kings of the earth? All right. So the woman is a figure or a symbol of Rome. And the fact that the woman is called a harlot and Babylon the Great Those are figures of speech that are used consistently in the Bible to depict false religious systems. And so when it calls this woman, mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, it's talking about this religious system that's a mystery because it actually started in ancient Babylon And it continued to be passed from one Gentile empire to another. And until this religious system became identified with a city. And the city was Rome. Follow me? All right, now let's go to Revelation 18. Revelation chapter 18 gives us another dimension of this revised Roman Empire and the form it takes, how it relates to this woman that is a false religious system. All right, I'm going to begin to read. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, and I'm going to read down to verse 7, and then I'm going to read some prophecies from the Old Testament that relate to this, and I want you to get the references down so that you can study these later this week. Okay, here we go. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illumined with his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit, and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. Now here's where we see that the religious system 
was tied in with the economic system. And it's going to become a very close relationship, especially in this future time, which is not far from now. I believe we're talking about the European Union, at least part of it, that this Antichrist is going to use as his power base to gain power over the world. But this brings in, chapter 18 brings in the economic business side of this system. So it says that, verse 4, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back even as she has paid, and give back to her double according to her deeds, in the cup which she has mixed, mix twice as much for her. To the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensuously, to the same degree give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, and I'm not a widow, and I will never see mourning. All right, now, remember I told you that if you're going to study the Bible, especially the book of Revelation, your most important tool is what? A concordance. That's right. Because all of these terms that the Apostle John, under the inspiration of God's Spirit, uses, all of these terms are figures of speech that are explained somewhere else in the Bible, or they're amplified somewhere else in the Bible. So a concordance is something that is really, really important. I'll give you another study too. If you have a computer, type in Bible Gateway, one word, lowercase, BibleGateway.com. And then just click on and a Bible study system will come up. Doesn't cost you anything. Now people contribute to it because they're blessed by it. They don't make you pay anything for it. Now that will come up. And up at the top it'll say, you know, you want some scripture or if you want a word traced or something like that, you just type it in, click on it, and it'll look it up. But you can type in like Revelation chapter 18. And then you look to the next little, it's a little band that goes across. You look to the next thing, it'll have, it automatically comes up with a new international version of the Bible. But you click on the little arrow next to it, and it will give you about 35 different versions of the Bible, including German and so forth. Also, it has three different versions of the Greek text. If you go to that, always use Westcott and Hart. It's the best. But you click on that, and it'll bring it up. And if you want to change versions, you just click that arrow, pick out the next one, click on it, and then hit Update, and it'll change it over to... I was just teaching my wife this stuff. Dude, she's laughing. <laughs> Pretty cool, wasn't it, honey? But the best one that they have is the New American Standard. See, I don't think I'm wasting time by teaching you how to study because that's something you'll have when I'm gone. The best version to get is the New American Standard Bible because it has letters in parentheses next to different words in the text. And you click on that, and it'll come down to references at the bottom of the page. And you click on that whether it's A or AB or whatever, you click on that, and it will bring up all of the scriptures that have that word or that idea in it right away. Well, I want you to remember that because that will you will have more blessing and fun doing that than you ever thought possible. Now, here's what I did. I clicked on it. Of course, I... I have other ways of doing it, but I said, I'm going to see how this works so that you can do it. So when I got down to here, I sit as a queen, 
and I'm not a widow, and will never see mourning. Now, this is the whore of Babylon, Mystery Babylon, talking here, okay? And I, you know, in my mind, I've read the Bible through several times, so I remember some places. I didn't know the address, but I remember there were places in the Old Testament where it said, I sit as a queen. I remember Isaiah, but I, I can find it. But I just clicked on the reference, and here's what it brought up. Isaiah chapter 47, verse 1, first. And I'm going to read from that. You don't have to turn there if you don't want, but write down Isaiah 47, verse 1 through 13. This is what it says. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. You see, the Chaldeans were in this land before the Babylonians. And the Chaldeans became a special caste of astrological priests. And they were the ones that were big in the early empires. They were used as advisors to the kings and so forth. But it's interesting. You know where that is? Iraq. All of this is in Iraq. So it has some significance. You know, what we're studying here tonight is going to show you that something is going to happen in Iraq to pacify it because the Bible predicts there's going to be a lot of stuff that happens there that's important. Maybe they will listen to Bush. Now, not that he makes all the right decisions, but at least he's, he knows that we can't leave that place like the Wild West. It'll become a proving ground for Al-Qaeda. They'll just set up the biggest training camp for terrorists that there ever existed on this planet. And by the way, my idea, somebody ran this, uh, oh, it was Clinton. He was talking with Larry King. We heard him on the way over here. He mentioned the Kurds. He said, you know, we've got to be careful that we don't get the Kurds so powerful that they upset the Turks. Well, I thought to myself, well, I'll leave it to him. Just always come up with the wrong idea. But, you know, I don't care if they upset turkeys. But there are some people who are beginning to get the idea of what I've been saying. The way to settle the problem in Iraq is train and arm the Kurds to the teeth. They're the only ones that's been honorable and kept their word with us. They've been mistreated by all of the rest of the Muslim. They're Muslim, but they've been treated, mistreated by all the rest of the Muslim world. And they're really good fighters. They just need some help. Arm them to the teeth and turn them loose. Say, okay, go down there and straighten that mess up with the Shiites and the Sunnis. <laughs> and believe you me, they would do it with great smiles on their face. Because those guys gassed two whole towns of theirs and killed women, children, and everybody else with nerve gas. So, you know, they highly motivated. Fight fire with fire. Meanwhile, let's get back to the virgin daughter of Babylon here. It says, O daughter, of, uh, in verse 1 again, For she, you shall no longer be called tender and delicate. Sit silently and go into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For you will no longer be called, what? The queen of the kingdoms. You see, there's where it begins to tie in. I was angry with my people, God says, and I profaned my heritage and gave them into your hand. You did not show mercy to them. On the age you made your yoke very heavy. This is when God disciplined his people, but he disciplined those who treated them badly. Yet you said, verse 7, I will be a queen forever. These things you did not consider nor remember the outcome of them. Now then, hear this, you sensual one who dwells securely, who says in your heart, I am. And there's no one besides me. I will not sit as a widow, nor no loss of children. But these two things will come on you suddenly. And one day, now notice it's the suddenness of this that shows this is a prophecy about the second coming of Christ. Because it talks about a judgment that's coming suddenly. It says, in one day you will suffer loss of children and widowhood. They will come on you in full measure in spite of your many sorceries. 
And in spite of the great power of your spells, you see, Isaiah is pointing out that this strain of demonic religion started on the plains of Shinar, which is in Iraq, started the Tower of Babel, and there the first religion was concocted, the first organized religion. And so God traces all false religion back to Babylon. And that's why he talks about mystery Babylon. There would be this false religion that would keep permeating Gentile power all the way down through the ages. And it would go from one kingdom to another kingdom. So he shows this and he says, in spite of your many sorceries. Now, this word is a word for, it's a kind of a black magic. It's associated with a demonic kind of worship. And also talks about the great power of your spells. These people were able to concoct and to spin out great spells through their false religious system. And, you know, most Americans have never come in contact with real false religion. You know, we think of it as, well, they're a bunch of nuts, we know it's wrong, and it, it's just a, a bunch of falsehood. Why can't they see through it? Well, I've seen miracles done in the power of demons. And I have seen things done that were purely supernatural, and they were in the power of demons. And this is what hooks people. You know, a lot of, uh, in our day, Christianity has pretty well been wiped out of this country. And now you have people who have, without any guidebook, like the Bible that would tell them the truth, there are people that are delving into these things and, oh, look, there really is some power here. And they get hooked on it. But that's what this is talking about. So it says, in spite of these things, this destruction is coming upon you. Then it says, you felt secure in your wickedness and said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge, they have deluded you, for you have said in your heart, I am and there's no one beside me, but evil will come on you, which you will not know how to charm away, and disaster will fall on you, for which you cannot atone. Stand fast now in your spells and in your many sorceries with which you have labored from your youth. This talks about how this religion has just gone from one place to another. Perhaps you will be able to profit. Perhaps you may cause trembling. You're worried with your many counsels. Let now the astrologers, those who prophesy by the stars, those who predict by new moons, stand up and save you from what will come upon you. You see... This is talking about the fact that there's always been this strain of powerful false religion that has gone from one Gentile world kingdom like Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, Roman Empire phase one, and it's all going to come in real power in Roman Empire phase two. That's what this book says. So it is warning us about this. It says, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to be able to go through all of this, so I'm not going to read it. But I will give you some references to read, okay? Read, these are all prophecies about the great war that's coming called War of Armageddon. Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 15. Isaiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 3. Ezekiel chapter 30, verses 4 through 6. All right, now I'm going to resume reading in Revelation chapter 18, verse 8. For this reason, in one day her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning and famine, 
and she will be burned up with fire, for the Lord God who judges her is strong. And the kings of the earth who committed acts of immorality and lived sensuously with her will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning. Standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city, Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore, cargoes of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and every kind of citron wood and every article of ivory and every article made from very costly wood and bronze and iron and marble and cinnamon and spice and incense and perfume and frankincense and wine and olive oil and fine flour and wheat and cattle and sheep and cargoes of horses and chariots and Mercedes and Porsches and VWs. <laughs> you see, what's he doing? He is predicting that it is actually through this religious system that mysteriously survived the Roman Empire phase one. It survived the political. It collapsed near the end of the fourth century. But spiritually, mystically, the power continued. And it shows how that this religious power has always been wrapped up with politics and economy. And it's really going to be used to get a grip on the economy as this comes up. And I believe it's no accident that the European Union has formed. I, I remember back in 1956 when I first studied all of this and I said, there's going to be a United States of Europe. People wanted to lock me up for being a crazy man. Everybody said, that's impossible. There'll never be a European Union. But I saw in prophecy that it had to be. There had to be ten nations emerge out of the ruins of the old Roman culture and people, and they would have to be uh, contiguous people, and Rome would have to be the capital. And now all of these things have come. Now there are associate memberships to the European Union, but do you know it's the only ones that are full members, as I've said this before, is the Western European Union, which is composed of the original ten. And I believe that's going to be the base that the Antichrist is going to come in and use. But it's going to be the religious power system that will help bring all of these things together. And that's what this is talking to us about. Because Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, is that religious system. And by the way, you remember what I told you last week? There's a difference between the people in the system and the system. Because there are a lot of people in the system that are born again. But there's a system that's as perverted as that strain that came right down from the plains of Shinar. Now, let's read on. And slaves and human lives, actually human souls, in other words, this thing, the worst thing that happens is that it captures the souls of men and women. Verse 14 the fruit you long for has gone from you, and all things that were luxurious and splendid have passed away from you, and when men will no longer find them. The merchants of these things, who became rich from her, will stand at a distance because of the fear of her torment, weeping and mourning, and saying, Woe, woe, the great city, she who was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold, and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour such great wealth has been laid waste. 
and every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor and as many as make their living by the sea stood at a distance and were crying out as they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads and were crying out, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city in which all who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. Now here's a, a critical turning point in all of this I'm reading. God is judging this system first and foremost for what they have done to true believers. That's why it says here, God is going to judge her for you, for what this system has done to you. And he goes on to say, Verse 21, then a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, so will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. And the sound of the harpist and musician, the flute players and trumpeters will not be heard in you any longer. And no craftsman of any craft will be found in you any longer. And the sound of a mill will not be heard in you any longer. The light of the lamp will not shine in you any longer, and the voice of the bridegroom and bride will not be heard in you any longer. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, because all the nations were deceived by what? You know what the original Greek word is? Pharmakia. You ever heard the word pharmacy? Come from that word. It comes from a root word that means to mix poisons. But pharmakia in the first century when this was written came to be associated with the practice of the occult using drugs. And so it, it's a kind of a cult worship mixed with the use of drugs. Well, that fits right in today, doesn't it? And it's interesting that one of the reasons God continued judging the world after the horrible judgments that are described in Revelation chapter 9, that chapter ends by saying this, 9.21. After all the terrible things that happened, it says, And the rest of mankind, verse 20, who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent, of the works of their hands, so as not to worship what? Demons. And the idols of gold and of silver and brass and of stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries. You see, this is, there are four sins that are particularly named here. Murder, the practice of the occult, sorceries, Immorality, sexual immorality, and theft. So it shows that this is something that permeated that time. So it says, again now in chapter 18, verse 23 at the end of it, it says, because all the nations were deceived by your sorceries. So I believe you have to take this in a broader context because what this is doing is saying, that the Babylon the Great, the great harlot, that she used false religion and mixed sorcery in with Christianity in order to deceive people. And nations were deceived by it. Now, we go on and it says in verse 24, and in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all those who have been slain on the earth. So this is the destruction of a prophecy about the destruction of 
economic, economical Babylon that is tied in with the religious system. And there's one last thing I want to leave with you, and I'm going to unravel all of this next week. I'm just sort of throwing a bunch of things at you so that you can think about it this week. But there's one more thing. Remember at the end of Revelation chapter 17, it said that the Antichrist would turn on the woman and he would destroy it. Now, he doesn't destroy the city of Rome. He destroys the system of religion that is associated with Rome. And so I want to show you something that many great scholars have studied, especially Dr. Merrill F. Unger, Dallas Theological Seminary. He's the one that first talked about this with me. But I believe he's right, and I'll see if I can unravel it for you. This is found in Zechariah chapter 5. Zechariah chapter 5. Now, Zechariah is just two, back, two books back from the New Testament. We find the beginning of Matthew and then go two books back. Malachi, Zechariah. Or you can do what I always do. I go to the table of contents <laughs> and use the page numbers. All right, now, in Zechariah chapter 5, verse 5, it says, Then the angel who was speaking with me, this is speaking to the prophet Zechariah, went out and said to me, Lift up now your eyes and see what this is going forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is the ephah going forth. Again he said, This is their appearance in all the land. All right, now, an ephah. An ephah was for centuries the standard of measurement for commerce. It's a basket, and it was made specifically to hold a certain amount. It's called an ephah. And it wasn't just in Israel. It was throughout the ancient world. They used that as the standard of measurement. It became associated with commerce itself. Now, there's something else, and these are easy symbols, easy figures of speech to find, find the meaning to. When it says this is their appearance in all the land, it means this is understood to be the common measurement. All right, now, verse 7, and behold, a lead cover was lifted up. There was a lead cover on top of this basket, this ephah. And so it says a lead cover was lifted up, and this is a woman sitting inside the ephah. A woman. And there's a lead cover on it to make sure that the woman stays in the ephah. Now, then he said, looking at the woman, this is wickedness. And he threw her down into the middle of the ephah and cast the lead weight on its opening. Now, the woman doesn't want to be there, does she? No. This is a picture of the woman of Revelation chapter 17, the whore of Babylon. It's a picture of her, the woman. She is forced into the ephah, which is a symbol of commerce. So it's showing us a picture that she's being entrapped by commerce against her will. But when the angel identifies this woman that's been locked into this commerce, he says, she is pure wickedness. Now, look what happens. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and there were two women Two women were coming out with the wind in their wings, and they had wings like wings of a stark. And they lifted up the ephah between the earth and heaven. I don't know whether you have seen this, but even today, the symbol of commerce is two women with wings and usually holding a balance. 
And if you're over in Europe or in the Middle East, there will also be an ephah at their feet. That's from, from time immemorial. That's been a symbol of commerce. So it shows that these two women, they come and they pick up this ephah, the symbol of, of world commerce, with the woman in it. That's mystery Babylon. It's got to be. Because this is predicting in Zechariah about the time all of these things would come to a head in just the time just before Christ returns. And this is what it says about that. They lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heavens, and I said to the angel who was speaking with me, where are they taking the ephah? Then he said to me, to build a temple for her in the land of Shinar. And when it is prepared, she will be set there on her own pedestal. This tells me a lot of things. First of all, land of Shinar, Babylon, modern Iraq. And it says that, it doesn't say it's going to build a city for her, it says it's going to build a great temple for her. So what is going to take place, and by the way, you see, all of this fits in with what we know from other things that are predicted about this time. The Antichrist will use this false religious system to get his power. But once he gets his power, he doesn't want this system controlling him. So the first thing he does, and then destroy it right away, the first thing he does is say, oh, you're too great to just be hanging around here in Rome. We're going to take you back to where you started, to the plains of Shinar. And there we'll erect this temple the like of which has never been seen. And we're going to move you from the Vatican <laughs> to Babylon. Now, before you get shocked, this religious system is going to be made up of all churches, not just this one. All churches that don't have to get new pastors after the rapture are going to be part of this. And believe me, all will be represented. And some out of all of these systems will have gone to meet Christ because they believe that Jesus died for their sins and they received the gift of pardon he purchased for them. And so that's the key, you see. That's why when Jesus talked about the wheat and the tares, he says, don't try to separate them. Tares look exactly like wheat. And you can't tell the difference until harvest time when the wheat will have bulbs of wheat on it and the other one won't. So he says, don't try to separate it. Wait until I come. I'll do the job. So that's, you know, that all fits in here. But I believe what this is saying, there are all kinds of things that we can learn from this. Number one, it's what I said. Iraq has an important place in the not-too-distant future because there is where this religious system, I think probably near the beginning of the tribulation, that seven-year period, near the beginning of that, he's going to, the Antichrist is going to force the system over to the plains of Shinar, which is where the Tower of Babel was. Now, that also tells me something, that there will be some kind of a, a reproachment made between this system and all of the other false religions like Islam and so forth. Man, can you imagine getting all of them to get, be part of this? Buddhism and Shintoism and all kinds of things like that will all merge into this one system. And so this system is going to have its own temple built on the plains of Shinar, and I'm, I'm sure it'll be by the Tower of Babel. So whatever happens in the near future, that tells me it's not going to be in vain because there's not, that's not going to turn into a training ground for al-Qaeda and turned into a, a place where no one could have anything 
uh, safety there. Something's going to happen. But it does tell me how that this is the beginning of what is predicted about this situation at the end of the book of uh, Revelation 17, where it says that the Antichrist will hate the whore and destroyer. This is the first step toward doing that. Now, I think that this system realizes that this is not a good move because it's being forcefully taken over. You follow me? But I believe that prophecy is coming together so fast, like I've always had a hard time understanding Revelation chapter 18 particularly because it's difficult to unravel. But I believe by next week, God's going to show me, he's already showing me some things that I will talk to you about next week that I believe will stun you because it's all here, and I wanted you to hear the scriptures and all of that, and then we'll go back and and be sure and read those that I gave you references to because there's one that for the first time has convinced me that the United States is involved here. One of those references I gave you. Okay? So you motivated to come back, I hope? (laughs) We're almost there. We're almost to the second coming of Christ in chapter 19. That's where the hope is, where he's coming for us. And I believe that this is a time as never before where we need to have our eyes fixed on our hope, which is when Jesus said, when you see all of these things, recognize that I'm at the door ready to return. He says, when you see these things, lift up your heads for your redemption grows near. And I've been studying prophecy now since 1956, early 1956. And I've never seen anything like what we're seeing today. By the way, I just realized that very soon it'll be the 50th anniversary of me being in the ministry. Very soon. And I placed that at the time God called me. Let us pray. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name for your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Teach us. We come at this humbly, and we pray that you'll give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And I pray that that everyone here will recognize there's nothing to be afraid of. We've accepted the gift of pardon that Jesus gave his life to give us. He just simply said, Lord, I fall short, and there's no way I can be good enough for you to accept. So I receive the gift of pardon that you gave your life to purchase for me. Thank you for giving me forgiveness and eternal life. For all that know that, all who have done that, give great hope and great encouragement. Father, we do pray for our country. We pray for those brave soldiers that are over in Iraq and on the many battlefields, Afghanistan, many other places. Lord, we pray that you will use that time of difficulty to bring them to personal faith in Jesus Christ, that you will give them courage, faith, hope, and protection. We pray for all the families of the servicemen. Lord, please supply their needs and encourage them. And Lord, we pray for our country that you will Watch over this country, especially watch over our young people who are in schools at this time. I pray that your spirit will restrain the gate that's been opened for all of these demonic acts. In Jesus' name, amen. (laughs) 